So the Thank next you. the next session, while my handlers handle necessarily, um, that we move across to is global experiences with driving relevance, awareness, and digital inclusivity. And we have two star performers, hopefully, um, Mr. Chris Pierce and Dr. Xiaogong Jia. Um, see you, uh, Peter. There you go, Dr. Jia. So if I could encourage um, the shy Mr. Pierce and the shy Dr. Jia to turn their cameras on and I will welcome them a little bit more formally. We'll transition across to the next session. And again, I thank you both for your time um, and your willingness to join. Xiao Gang is, Dr. Xiao Gang Jia, is the senior expert and director of the Center for International Policy Research at Tencent Research Institute, which is of course a part of Tencent. Um, previously, Dr. Jia was the deputy director of research for SIIS, the Shanghai Institute for International Studies, and a diplomat in China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was also, it's worth noting, the Chevening Fellow and a STARS Foundation Fellow. He is a very big brain. Um, and we also have Mr. Chris Pierce, the Chief Legal and Regulatory Officer for Areadu Myanmar. Um, and Areadu is, of course, one of the two international mobile operators granted licenses by Myanmar in 2013. Um, so very excited to have Chris here. He's one of uh, the principal architects in reality in, in Myanmar of creating, driving and implementing a regulatory and policy framework for sustainable competitive mobile industry in Myanmar. And you'll see what we've done in this transition here with these two gentlemen, um, by, by bringing you two of the more phenomenal use cases and the benefits that emerge from these use cases. Xiao Gang sits on top of what has been transformational as the use case of the Tencent platform um, with its massive user base and the benefits and, and enjoyment through the entertainment, but also the payments facilitation and the access to so many of those applications that Eric was talking about previously. While Chris has overseen what is probably one of those most mythical of greenfield opportunities where we went from a standing start in Myanmar to having very few little mobile connectivity to be almost 100% coverage and, and a huge percentage of um, registration and access in that country in a phenomenally short amount of time. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm delighted to have both of them here. And I'll ask first Xiao Gong and then Chris to give us their initial thoughts on, on these ideas around their case studies in, in digital inclusivity and relevance. So firstly, Xiao Gong to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, great. So thank you very much. I'm honored to have this opportunity to share some of my views on the digital inclusiveness. In fact, I just want to give um, some like, example of our companies like Super APP, it's called the WeChat. It's like the uh, Facebook or Twitter uh, in China is similar like Super APP. But, uh, we have several sub-functional uh, app, app inside this this one. So let's, I want to maybe say uh, three like aspects of WeChat. Um, the app's like uh, in, in contribution to digital inclusiveness. The first one is called the mini program, and the second is called the subscription account. And the third aspect I want to stress a little bit about the job creation by the WeChat ecosystem. So for the first one, we have a sub app inside WeChat. It's called a mini program. So in fact, it's kind of app embedded uh, inside the WeChat. Uh, we can see here it's very easy to find inside WeChat. You can. You, what you need to do is just to um, open the discovery discover like page and to click mini program. Then you can um, do a lot of like uh, uh, things in this regard. So it's like it's in fact a light WeChat application 
uh, without the need to download. So users can open the application just by uh, scanning the QR code or searching on WeChat. And it's easy to use uh, at any time and no need to install or uninstall. And it's a, it's a very comprehensive uh, coverage. So you, what the um, small and medium sized um, enterprises or some other institutions, what they need to do is just to develop once and it covers all smartphones uh, with different bands or browser types. So it's very easy uh, to develop and it's very accessible. Uh, you just uh, scan or search and you can share it with your friends. So it's very easy to use, right? And uh, it's uh, 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 in regard to the experience, like right? it's as fast as and powerful as a native APP. So the mini, mini program is very popular now, in fact, inside China. You can see that uh, it has, in fact, accelerated uh, the SME's uh, digital transformation. Uh, currently, the number of mini programs almost uh, exceeds uh, 3.8 million. So that means more than 3.0 million institutions, including small and medium-sized enterprises, they have developed their mini program inside WeChat. So it's, it's quite a big number. And the daily uh, uh, active users uh, have been more than 400 million um, users per day, like, and the MAU is 800 million plus. Uh, what is interesting is the transaction amount uh, inside the mini program uh, in 2020, it has exceeded 2 trillion RMB uh, in last year, in fact. It's almost, I think, uh, almost uh, 300 billion, um, 300 billion US dollar. So the amount is quite significant. So why uh, does mini program has achieved this kind of uh, digital inclusiveness like uh, effects? And I think two aspects. The first one is the benefits to SMEs. Uh, because it can help them to reach the huge users of WeChat. Uh, WeChat has a user pool uh, of almost, I think, 1.2 billion. So it's, it's a huge like, um, market uh, targets. And then it can help them digitalize their business operations at very low cost. These institutions, including SMEs, they don't need to uh, spend uh, like repeated like, uh, uh, money to develop different APPs uh, on different platforms. So, and the second aspect uh, uh, is to the users. Uh, for the users, they don't need to install too many APPs. It's very, sometimes you will feel it's not very uh, happy, like just to install so many uh, APPs in one uh, uh, cell phone, right? And they can reach very abundant services and uh, goods uh, just inside the WeChat um, app, so it's it's very easy uh, to the users. So that's why it has uh, achieved so uh, much progress in just uh, several years. Uh, I mean, it's very important for the M uh, SMEs particularly because in China, many SMEs they have no um, in they have not enough like uh, talents and uh, capital to develop. Um, many APPs. So this mini program is very helpful for them to expand their business um, and to have uh, profits. The other important function of WeChat is called a subscription account. Um, in fact, what, what I want to stress uh, with the subs subscription account is, is information and the content uh, carrier, like the nature of it and it's a promotion of uh, knowledge uh, diffusion inside China. Although China has uh, developed very fast, like in past decades, but many, uh, a much proportion of its population uh, is still um, 
quite low, uh, lowly, like uh, um, digit, in terms of digital uh, literacy. So it's very important for some um, platform enterprises or APP uh, to help them uh, have better like, access and uh, easier to uh, get understanding of the content online. So what is WeChat, uh, WeChat subscription account? In fact, it's inside WeChat and uh, it's regularly um, sharing share information and the content uh, with its users. And uh, it's only pushing one article a day and no push notifications to users, only a red dot beside the thumbnail. And the original content can be certified and reshared uh, by other accounts uh, with mention to the original publisher. So this point is very important because it will encourage the uh, original and uh, innovation or creation of digital content. And because the revenue from the readers tips uh, and display ads on articles, because if the original content is very good, then the readers will give tips to the uh, uh, producer and you, it can attract more like ads uh, on its article page. So this is very important to um, um, incent, incent, in, to give incentives to the uh, digital content uh, producers to uh, have a, a very high quality uh, digital content. And though only the very frequently read account can appear on the top of subscription screen. So it's, uh, we'll have a, a selective uh, mechanism and it works for individuals and uh, companies alike. Both institutions and individuals can be the uh, digital content uh, creator. So we can see here. And it has promoted knowledge diffusion in China very extensively and uh, effectively. Just to give like several examples here. The first one is the Reuters like, news. Uh, with this, even the very um, remote area, some parents and rural people, they can get this uh, news coverage very uh, instantly and uh, uh, accurately. So it's very good for them to understand the uh, public affairs inside China or international affairs in the world. And the second one is the, called the global technology map. It's a very popular um, subscription account in China, in fact, in, especially in the middle class uh, population, because it will have like very um, real time coverage of those hot uh, technology and science issues in the easy, in the easy understanding way uh, to uh, carry this information and this knowledge to the uh, readers. So it's very uh, popular. And the third one is called the uh, Museum of Anhui Province. So this is a museum and uh, history and many similar like uh, subscription accounts. So in many places in China, because China is very big, it's very difficult for every people to go to the uh, museums by themselves. But with this subscription account, uh, many people, uh, even the um, students in, in primary or middle schools in, in the very remote areas of China, they can understand the uh, content of history and museum very, very easily. And the last one is the uh, painting arts, like it's kind of education um, because it's, it's, it's very difficult as well for those people to get access to the real ones. But with this, it's very easy for them to, uh, to, to know this. And uh, one very interesting uh, example uh, can be that, uh, such as a grandma, a grandma in rural China, uh, they even don't, don't uh, read, they don't read the words, characters of Chinese, uh, but they can, um, listen, watch the videos uh, through these subscription accounts so they can learn how to uh, cook. So this, this is very popular as well. Um, what I just want to uh, stress is it does uh, promote knowledge diffusion in the very large scale in China. 
Of course, uh, it is thanks to the uh, high penetration rate of a mobile uh, smartphone um, uh, pen penetration rate in China. Um, but uh, in my personal uh, view, it could be the one of the largest uh, knowledge of diffusion process or moment in, in China's history. And uh, it's, it is thanks to the WeChat um, APP. So that's my uh, several points to share with you. Thank you. I don't think you should be too harsh on people for not being able to read their Chinese characters very fast, Xiao Gang. My, my reading's slow, so you should, you should be lenient if people can't read their Chinese characters too fast, particularly in the rural areas. Um, just before I move on to Chris, was I correct in hearing your figure of WeChat, Tencent has one, WeChat has one to 1.2 billion SME subscribers, SME base. Did I get that figure right? Xiaogang, uh -huh. did, I, did I hear your figure correctly? You have 1.2 billion SMEs on the WeChat platform? No, 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 no. It's uh, 1.2 billion users of WeChat. Ah, but uh, the yeah. subscription number, I think it's uh, 30 million around right. the number, 30 million. Okay. And, and the subscription account, it's one subscription account gives you access to all of those services and, or you have to have multiple different subscription accounts? We have multiple, uh, many, many uh, subscri subscription accounts. Uh, right. Every subscri subscription account uh, is created or registered by an individual person or institution. So for these uh, individual person or institutions, they can provide the digital content as they would like to, okay? Right, okay. In, in different aspects. Okay, and your, your figures, they were still huge for, for the number of mini programs, which is obviously a key enablement piece inside the platform, those mini programs that are hosted on WeChat. Which sectors are you seeing the, the significant uptake or the significant publication? of programs which sectors are leading i assume entertainment uh, it's uh, services and uh, uh, retail it's so, i think it's the biggest portion um, in terms of mini program right? okay and i assume you see that growing out to cover most sectors over a period of time or you think that there's sectors that are less um less likely to have mini program enablement um every person um, every WeChat users, um, averagely speaking, they spend 20 minutes every day on these mini programs. So, in fact, it's quite a big portion of user time on internet because it, you, because it's average uh, level. If you yeah. just to take uh, take into account the individual level, could be very huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chris. Do you have a Do you have a WeChat account? I mean, I just assumed everyone had a WeChat account now. Do you you've, you got a WeChat account? I do not. <laughs> really? I'm quite surprised. Well, um, after we finish this, I'm sure Xiao Gang is going to take you aside and subscribe you up. Um, you can probably get a good deal for some of the, um, the museums if you talk to him nicely. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, Mr. Pierce. Um, can you use a few minutes to bring us up to? up to date on just what a transformation the mobile piece, the mobile platform has been in Myanmar? Sure, it's a, a pleasure to be here, Peter, with, with you and Xiao Gong, and, and thank you to the IIC for, uh, for the opportunity. Um, I love these conferences. It was great to listen to Eric about uh, just what 5G is, 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 is going to mean. Um, probably a, a useful for me just to give a bit of a snapshot of, of just how transformational um, our technologies are to uh, a population, and uh, an example where you can really see from from zero to sixty what that uh, what that looks like. If you track back in Myanmar to just 2013, 2014, um, digital penetration would have been mobile penetration would have been uh, far less than 10 percent of the um, of the population. No fixed line legacy. Uh, infrastructure either. So really an unconnected nation. 
uh, when I arrived in, in 2015, you can't use a credit card. Um, there are no ATMs. Uh, digital technology was just completely absent. Um, and so uh, the government of the day initiated a, a process to grant two um, international licenses. So Telenor and Uridu um, were the two that, uh, that were granted licenses and entered the market. Um, uh, Telenor entered with a basic 2G um, technology at the time, which really addressed the needs of a population that had had no access before in terms of what devices could handle and that sort of thing at that point. Uh, Uridu committed to launch uh, a 3G only network, which, uh, which, we, uh, which we did. Our coverage commitments, this is something as basic as that. Our coverage commitments were geographic because the country had not yet had a census. So they weren't really sure how many people there were and where they were in the country. Uh, it turns out it's a country of about 55 million people. Um, after the two major cities of Mandalay and Yangon, it's pretty, pretty dispersed, gets remote very quickly, uh, mountainous, so very difficult terrain to, uh, to build out over. Um, and here we are in uh, 2021. Uh, we now have 4G technology that reaches 95% of the population. Um, tens of thousands of, uh, of kilometers of fiber, uh, well, well north of 10, between 10 and 20,000 probably towers across the country, uh, and a population that has been thoroughly enabled uh, and, and digested and, and utilized the technology as quickly as, as anywhere in the world. Uh, so data consumption rates here are just as they are in the, um, in the rest of the world. I've heard people come back from uh, from Europe and say they're glad to get back to Myanmar because the coverage is so much better here uh, in terms of, of utilizing their, um, their mobile devices. And so what we do, for instance, we have between 13 and 14 million um, active subscribers. We're the third uh, in the market. Um, and the other, the, the things that that has enabled uh, for, the, um, for the population in the digital world is uh, is is truly remarkable. Mobile financial services, as you would expect in a in a country like uh, like Myanmar, that's largely unbanked, uh, has huge prospects um, for growth here. Uh, and in a very short time, as I said, a, a country that didn't have ATMs just a few years ago, the largest bank now has eight million users of its payment scheme, um, KBZ Pay. Uh, um, we've launched a, part of our uh, coverage commitment was. Uh, license commitment was to initiate a mobile financial service which um, which we've done and in this in this past year in the in the covid era and with the events that have uh, transpired in Myanmar um, you see the importance of of uh, what the digital infrastructure does for uh, does for people we're in a bit of a banking crisis right now where cash access to cash is very difficult um, and so the growth of digital payments uh, digital top-ups on uh, um, on our application. We have uh, half a million um, visitors a day now to uh, our My Uridu application and, and people doing between now, it's for upwards of 40% of our top-ups of, uh, um, of, of a SIM card are done electronically now. Uh, um, so the, uh, the access to that technology and now the essentialness of that technology when um, people cannot have access to the physical things that they need uh, has truly uh, has truly been remarkable. So that's just a brief snapshot, Peter, of of, uh, of what's happened in uh, um, in Myanmar uh, in terms of uh, digital inclusion um, in a, in a country where you know seventy percent of the population probably living on uh, not not so distant past on two hundred dollars a month or less, uh, and uh, a SIM card that in twenty thirteen would have cost you between one and 3,000 US dollars uh, now costs about a thousand chat uh, or, or, uh, or less. Um, and so the access, immediate accessibility to people who never would have had uh, access and yet uh, extremely, you know, 90% literacy rates in, in Myanmar. So not a population waiting for this type of technology to do all the things that, uh, that they in their hearts no doubt knew they could have done and that this now enables them to do. Truly, uh, truly remarkable um, and uh, an honor to have been part of that process up till now. Including all of those things that Dr. Jar is offering on his platform that you can go to the virtual museum and so <laughs> exactly. on. Before, before we get to some of those services, um, and I, I remember 
being in me and Marion and getting asked five thousand dollars for my SIM card for the first time I tried. So we take the point. Um, it, maybe I could just get you to double down on that inclusivity piece a little bit because it has been quite a dramatic transformation in those pictures we paint of leapfrogging or greenfield scenarios. This is probably one of the best examples that, that we've seen happen out there and shows what can be done. Um, I, I remember working with the central bank and, and as we were talking about the ability for people outside of Naypyidaw or Yangon to be able to access cash, they would tell the stories of the, the traders and the money people who were enabling merchants of the bus trips that they took where they would haul on suitcases of money and they kept trying to say people will never use electronic top-ups because people are quite embedded into this whole process and behaviors of having these suitcases of money that would get transported and i kept thinking that would have been one of the easiest things to disrupt um, i didn't think that ever sounded terribly secure to me and we had the kenya example sitting in front of us um, but that inclusivity opportunity has been phenomenal in Myanmar, hasn't it? it really, it, it, just in terms of basic communications and then the merchant enabling piece. Yes, uh, exactly right. Now, what you're saying, though, is, is true because, um, you know, for a variety of reasons, Myanmar would not be a country where the people necessarily trusted uh, the banking um, network or the, uh, the faith of their, of their money uh, um, in, that, in that setting. So you're right, physical... Uh, physical remittances uh, were uh, were, and I suppose to a certain well have become again <laughs> to a certain extent uh, um, the means of, uh, of of transferring money at this point, and consequently the money's not the not the not the cleanest historically physically. Uh, but that but so there was a behavioral um, uh, process to go through and a cultural process to go through in terms of the introduction of mobile financial services. To have people uh, um, understand and come to have faith uh, um, in what the digital wallet um, means and can do for them. So, uh, certainly for the first uh, few years, it, it has been an OTC and over-the-counter business where really it's just it's straight-ahead remittances from individual to uh, to individual. Um, but of course, you need an agent to withdraw cash for that to, for that to work. And given that to access to cash here is very difficult at the moment. Uh, that has really encouraged uh, an even greater um, acceleration of the growth of, of what digital payments can do. Everything for, you know, whether it's dispersing uh, um, uh, payments from NGOs to, to, to the population, whether it's payment of bills, whether it's uh, the movement, whether it's topping up, as I say, uh, um, your, uh, your device with airtime or, uh, or, or data. Uh, it, it, it has grown dramatically, I would say, on that front, there's still far greater growth to come in, uh, in Myanmar, especially as Peter, as you say, when you think of some of the African countries and the percentage of GDP activity that is uh, um, traversing over a digital platform, uh, that will no doubt um, uh, happen in, in time here as well. I mean, and then just the basic access to minutes and data is, is still a crucially important um, item. While we still have the things that uh, you're were, you were referring to later, you know, we've got online education here now because of because of COVID, all of that can happen because of the technology. I don't have to travel to Napida. I do Zoom meetings with the um, with uh, with the government in terms of all of all of their regulatory activities. None of that would have been happening just a, a very a very few years ago. Um, so uh, it has been it, it's been as. Uh, down to earth as any um, digital expansion I can imagine, because it's it's people in the countryside, in their fields, in their fishing boats, uh, um, in their long G, uh, who now have access to digital technology and know what to do with it. Uh, and in, because of the price points in an intensely competitive market with uh, four operators, um, it means that the the cost of access to that is extremely. Uh, uh, cheap as well. So the average revenue per unit, which you know is the one of the basic measures of profitability in our business, it's about between four and six thousand chat a month. Uh, but the data consumption rivals anywhere in the world. So this is in, U in, in, in U.S. dollars, Chris. Do, do the conversion for for the audience, if you can, two to three dollars. Yeah, yeah, because it's one yeah. of the most phenomenal commoditization 
processes, I think, in the history of mankind, that you've taken something that was at $5,000 for a sim and some exorbitant amount on minutes rates, and in the space of five years, you took it down to cents in transmission. It's just a phenomenal transformation that's, that's happening. I get, a, I get a reminder every month because I, I, I still keep alive my Canadian voice line and pay about uh, $100 Canadian just to keep the voice line alive. Uh, and here I can I can do all that and far more for a tenth the price. Yeah. As, so can shall go. As can shall go. And, and you've, you've segued nicely to something I wanted to get talk to you both about, which is that behavioral change. Um, and just before we get there, um, that issue of the, the changes that the pandemic has brought upon us. I heard our Honourable President for Life, Chris Chapman, at the outset of the, of the conference, um, talking about when we all get back to in-person meetings. And of course, we all, we, we all want to get back there and, and it'll be much nicer to do so and there's benefits to that. On the other hand, to your point, um, the fact that I can now have video conferences with the ministers in Naperdor or Jakarta or where, where, where they never were prepared to do this before. If there is one silver lining to this pandemic, it's that our senior political and bureaucratic leaders now will have these meetings on, on video conferences, a huge development. It speaks to that behavioural and that trust shift, which I still don't think is fully appreciated that has happened. And one of the points I wanted to get both of you to touch on, we talk about the lack of trust for banks or other institutions that was there in a jurisdiction like Myanmar previously, but you've got entire populations and it's true for China as well. Large populations have come onto these digital platforms meet via net mobile communications, having not experienced that transition. And so, the transitions we went through in Australia and America and uh, the UK to get people confident and comfortable with a digital ID and a digital passport and a digital bank account. We have jumped so fast on these other populations and it does speak to what's to come. And maybe I could just get you to speak to that a little bit first, Chris, and then go to Xiaogong, because we do have populations that are growing up now where this is the normal mode, that digital, that digital element, and that trust issue, that comfort issue is not really there for them. Yeah, it's true. Now, uh, it's, it's a remarkably young population in Myanmar as well. So uh, median age is about 27. Um, uh, I would like to tell my board that you need to remember the population's average age is 27. The average age of the government is 75. So uh, um, I would say it's the, it's the people at the top that I've had to have a pretty significant adjustment in understanding what a digital economy looks like, what 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 digital technology can do to extend access. Um, for very quickly, the, the the young here have have been growing up with uh, um, uh, with the technology and and use it for all the things you would imagine. A cart mark from the digital payments. It's it's gaming that uh, uh, that that's right at the top of the list. Um, uh, and and the the uh, infrastructure is 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 facilitating that sort of usage, but for sure you're right. I mean, just think 2G in 2014, we launched 3G, we launched 4G in 2016, um, and 5G uh, spectrum is is uh, scheduled to be allocated next year. So um, the the transition has been has been remarkable. Yeah, Shao Kang, can I get you to just talk to the same issue? of a population that really has grown up with digital connectivity and mobile digital connectivity? Uh, yes, of course. I think uh, what you said is a really important uh, issue and phenomenon, yeah. Um, because given the China's like a uh, big population um, and also the um, le uh, less uh, legacy of the traditional financial um, uh, infrastructures which have been a long time available in the Western developed countries. So it's a very important uh, feature. Um, we need to admit that the mobile payment uh, system facilitated by internet uh, companies have contributed a lot uh, to China's uh, market transactions and the, I think, uh, retailing like on, uh, internet retailing like uh, uh, per, per, per process. Uh, because which has developed very fast in past uh, uh, two decades. Um, 
but uh, what is going on now in China, inside China, I think many people here are aware uh, with that. Um, the authority is very uh, vigilant against the possible systematic uh, risks um, maybe raised by the new like financial, um, how to say, um, ecosystem, because this kind of like a platform based uh, internet uh, financial system is a new, um, new, new, new phenomenon. Um, um, very strange uh, to the uh, regulatory authority and uh, the platform uh, companies themselves are not very much um, exposed um, in this new um, form of, of financial like, uh, ecosystem. So I think it's kind of balance um, between um, do it um, and learn from it and uh, um, the regulatory authority will try to uh, observe the process, uh, give some um, space for the platform companies, and uh, will um, try their best to uh, prevent against the systematic uh, risks, I think, in this uh, process. Yeah. You, you, you had a couple of interesting points, which is sort of left of center of this issue. The, the, the question around um, opening processes up to allow the innovation and creativity to happen while wanting to make sure that systemic threats are managed properly, risk managed properly. Um, but I did want to come back to them because they, they looked important to the enablement piece. What, what was that focus you gave in the mini programs explanation to original content and the recognition of original content. Um, and that sounded quite interesting and in that you were, you were making a big pitch for we recognize and we give access and, and recognition that original contact, con, content will then get tagged and supported. Um, that, that's an interesting concept that obviously one that's challenged publishers and the transition from traditional media into digital media in many countries around the world. Could you just elaborate on that one a little bit more and, and how you're enabling content publishers to get the recognition and the opportunity for their work? Uh, in, in fact, I think for the most um, uh, dig co uh, digital content producers, they are um, not so much um, uh, related or, or, or relevant to the uh, content uh, control, because as long as you don't touch the very, very sensitive like uh, topics, it's okay. You just uh, write everything that you want. And uh, the, uh, in fact, we have uh, created the um, mechanism to give them incent incentives. Because if you have written a very good uh, article, like uh, uh, either on. On, on, on social issues or just uh, like uh, historical uh, topics, then you can get um, quite much return from that. I can give you a, a, an example. Maybe one good uh, article in on the um, subscription uh, subscription account can have a return um, around I think a ten uh, one hundred thousand US dollars, like just for that single like uh, article. So if it's a high quality, quality like article, so it's quite um, average uh, in China. But for those very uh, for those articles uh, related to some um, sensitive issues, um, we needed to how to say manage that according to the uh, local laws and uh, regulations. So let, let's leave the sensitive issues one to the side. That's an entire conversation in itself, and I don't. I'm not. I'm not trying to. Um, duck that issue, but for the purposes of this issue of awareness and inclusivity, the interest here that I have at least is how you drive that, that opportunity. $100,000 for a particularly interesting article. You're, you're, you're telling me that the platform's recognizing that. So a good author will see the uptake of an interesting article. They're getting paid, they're getting their remuneration through the WeChat platform. Am I getting that right? No, no, in fact, uh, if, these, if, if the readers, the WeChat users, 
think this article is very good and they would be willing to give some tips to the author. So maybe for one article, there, there would be uh, more than like 1,000 readers give them tips. If every tip is equal to uh, 100 RMB, it could be uh, like 10,000 or, or, or 100,000 RMB because yep. the WeChat users is a so huge base. So even a very small portion of the readers think it's good, then the author can have a good, very good chance to have a big like uh, revenue from that high quality article. So that's why I, we try to, to, to incentivize the, these authors. Yeah. yeah. And, and I assume that, that that's driving a lot of the gaming developments and uptake as well, because again, you've got just a massive base for gaming designers and publishers to be playing to. Yes? Yes. Okay. Can I just pick up, before I go back to Chris for a similar, just check on, on where me and Mars at. The other piece that you had in there was the idea that the platform and the mini programs are helping SMEs to digitize their business opportunities. The reach mm -hmm. is obvious. They have a platform that gives them scale and reach out to a very big base of users. That, that's fairly obvious. But the idea that you're helping to digitize SME business operations, can you talk to that a little bit? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, because uh, such as a very um, small but very good reputation uh, restaurant in Shanghai, if, 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 if it wants to uh, develop an APP by itself, and the APP needs to adapt to different like uh, mobile phone systems, like uh, operation systems, it, it will cost a lot. But it, if, it, uh, to, if it develops a mini program uh, inside WeChat, it will cost quite uh, uh, less. Uh, um, and it will be available to different kind of uh, mobile phones systems. So it will save the um, restaurant quite a lot of money. However, because the users base, the user base of WeChat is huge. Uh, as soon as uh, its reputation gets spread, spread it like uh, among the users, it can have quite like, a huge return from the mini program. Like, okay, so basically if you're a retail operation or for example, a restaurant, you're able, because of the big base um, and the standardized interface and the payments enablement piece, you're basically taking care of all of those other supplementary pieces that a business has to, has to use. So they can focus on the business aspect. You're helping that's take true. care of the payments piece and the marketing piece. And, right, okay, that's true. That's true. Um, do, we, do we see similar developments in, in Myanmar? I mean, I know we're going through an interesting challenging time in Myanmar right now, Chris, but given, given the mobile uptake, are we seeing the emergence of similar platform bases? And you said games were such a big uptake. Are we seeing people come in and begin to publish to the market like this? Um, I think, well, you just, uh, you made a, a good point a while ago in terms of enablement and, uh, you know, the regulatory environment. Uh, um, in a, uh, permitting and enabling of all the types of of, of uh, services that can offer greater access and inclusion. And so on the mobile financial services side, for instance, um, having the central bank uh, be ahead of the game enough to understand the services they can trust uh, and that will assist the population is a challenge. Um, and the, the regulatory framework in, in Myanmar has always been playing catch up to, uh, uh, to the rollout of our, of our technology. So, you know, we, we don't yet have an independent regulator. You know, we're dealing with the same ministry that owns the incumbent to regulate the industry. Not to say that they haven't generally gotten the big ticket things right along the way, but I think it, it, it necessarily is a bit of a limiter to... Uh, um, uh, to things beyond basic, um, basic access and, uh, and inclusion. In terms of business, um, because there's of that fact of no fixed uh, legacy infrastructure, um, and because of the sort of history of the, of the economy, 
Uh, there's still, uh, you know, a, a rapidly developing small and medium sized enterprise uh, sector um, to to deliver all the things to people now that they couldn't, you know, have hoped to dream of such a very short time ago. So yes, there's a lot of enablement that can happen to uh, um, for local platforms. I would say there's a there's a lot of growth there to happen. Uh, yet beyond um, there, gaming, for instance, there was some. We had a very popular uh, uh, game that local content had developed a while ago, but that uh, it got so popular so quickly that the government got to fear that, in their view, it was gambling, um, uh, which is not officially permitted in in Myanmar. And so, uh, we ultimately had to um, had to take that off the market. But so that type of content creation has absolutely happened. It's a it's a uh, a very creative society, and so culturally. Um, uh, there's a lot of content that has gained uh, great access to, to, to people that's from local entertainers, singers, um, uh, songwriters, movie makers, you know, that can now reach a population they couldn't, they couldn't reach before. So some of that is still, I wouldn't say nascent, but it's got, it's got a lot of room to grow yet. And certainly the, um, the framework, the regulatory framework has, has uh, still a fair, a fair ways to go to truly enable all that, uh, all that we can offer people. Yeah, we, we in our world, we, we always look at the institutional enablement piece and the framework that's needed, the regulatory superstructure and setting up the institutions and trying to get the regulations correct. I still believe that a lot of this comes back to foresightful individuals who basically just get it and can see where the, the piece is going to go. And I think in Myanmar, at a couple of times, crucially, we've been lucky. We've, we've had a couple of individuals who actually understood the benefits overall for the country. You, you pick on, you identified the financial sector. I think we were very lucky in Myanmar to have a deputy uh, governor who was whip smart and just able to put in place some opportunities that could really bear some some lovely fruit um, in, in transforming an economy. That's okay. Um, I, I, I just wanted to check there quickly, uh, Petra and Amanda, I know that we're right on time. So with that, I do think that's probably an appropriate place to use this to wrap it up so I can hand over to our, um, our leadership in a timely fashion. Could I just please thank you both for your time and, and your generosity and your thoughts and insight today. So thank you both to Dr. Xiao Gamja and to Chris Pierce for their, their case study um, explanations of what's happening on the WeChat platform in China and with the mobile situation in Myanmar. And with that, Lynn, I think I'm handing this now back to your capable hands.